Hey guys, Ishan here. Uh, I'm coming at you guys today with another math and Yu-Gi-Oh! video, some of my favorite videos to make. However, these videos do take a lot of work to make, so if you enjoy them, please either you know leave a comment, like, or please subscribe. I'm almost at 300 su subscribers, and if you guys could get me there soon, I would really greatly appreciate it. Um, okay, well, let's get into the video. Today's topic is how many hand traps you should run in your Yu-Gi-Oh! deck. Now, this is a, a question that a lot of players approach sort of by feel. They sort of, oh, I like seven hand traps. I like six hand traps. I like, you know, five hand traps. And this video is sort of the idea is to sort of maybe, maybe give you some, some mathematical data. And I will be showing you some data in this video uh, for sure. Some mathematical data to help you make your decisions, help you get your formula work. You sort of get a framework for you to make your decisions for your Yu-Gi-Oh decks. Okay, let's actually talk about, well, this video is a little bit more complicated than just hand traps because it's actually not just about hand traps. It's about sort of defensive cards in general. I just think hand traps are sort of the, the, I, the, the most common style of defensive card these days. But we've got, you know, cards like Dimensional Barrier. They sort of stun your opponent for a whole turn. We've got a Pointer of the Red Lotus, which, which has been seen playing a lot of decks to sort of, you know, I'm going to set up my board and then flip up a Pointer of the Red Lotus take your best card from your hand for a turn, and then that will let me combo off into the next turn. Feedback is, uh, which I did a video on, which I'll link up there, very similar card in this sense, right? It's sort of, you banish your own extra deck to banish your opponents for a turn, sort of stops them for a turn. And now, while defensive cards are really good, I find that Yu-Gi-Oh players um, sort of fall into this trap of sometimes of focusing so much about stopping their opponent that they forget to play their own game. Now, okay, I promise the data is coming, but first you guys need to understand sort of where I'm coming from before I present you this data. Um, okay, so deck dilution, right? Now, <laughs> the picture is literally like, I, I it's literally I found on Google, it's like cough syrup diluted or something. But sort of the idea and the, the, what I mean by deck dilution is, okay, listen, if you're putting a bunch of defensive cards in your deck, like hand traps, like, you know, maybe cards to try to blow out your opponent, that sort of thing, maybe side deck cards, floodgates. If you put in too many or have too many in your deck, you might come to realize that you just brick, you, you can't even play. And now I know it sucks to lose to your opponent because you didn't have cards to actually stop them from doing what they wanted to do. But what's even worse is when you just cannot play, like you're, you're guaranteed to lose if you brick, usually, unless your opponent bricks too. But anyway, this is, you know, I'm just saying basically that you wanna be careful about how much defensive cards you put in your deck that in, you know, that takes away from your core strategy that doesn't really help you do your strategy, right? Well, okay, let's go back. Important thing to mention is, imagine you have a card like a Pointer of the Red Lotus. Well, if you brick with a Pointer of the Red Lotus or Feedback or Dimensional Barrier, the card is basically worthless to you. You know, you can activate it. It'll stop them for a turn. But if you cannot capitalize on your opponent's weakness because you bricked, because you have too much of this in your deck, then, or you know, too many of these in your deck, then your opponent's just going to literally go next turn and try to do the same thing. And when you can't stop them then then, you know, you're in trouble. Okay, so that's why this deck dilution concept is important. Okay, so hand traps, floodgates, whatever, it doesn't really, you know, they're all sort of similar. Okay, but to ask yourself how to answer this question with stats, and I said, I promise they're coming, but we've only got two more slides to go through. Okay, so you need to ask yourself, what are your deck's goals? Now, how does your deck operate? Now, how many defensive cards are good in an ideal hand? One or two, or maybe even three. For example, you know, Zodiac Rat, this, remember old Zodiac back in the day when Rat was at three, right? I mean, God, this deck only needed one Zodiac to basically play the entire game. That's why they could just jam so many defensive cards in their deck. Whereas maybe a deck like Adam Emancipator, you know, I mean, sometimes you can start with one, one card combos, but you really need a few cards really to sort of be, be certain that you can be certain that you can combo off and have a much more high likelihood of comboing off. So maybe a deck like Adam Emancipator wants to run way fewer defensive cards. Okay, so you also need to ask yourself, and I promise it's the last slide before we, we see the data, you also need to ask yourself, okay, what kinds of defensive cards are you playing? For example, in my Grand Major decks, I tend to run total blowout cards. I tend to run Ghost Reaper and Winter Cherries, Dimensional 
barrier, you know, I run floodgates, I run Nibiru sometimes, you know, and if I draw one of these, I'm pretty confident that, you know, if I've lined up my matchups right now, this is not only game one, but also this, this sort of advice I'm going to about to tell you or about to look at is also you should keep in mind for side decked games, you know, but sometimes they just totally blow your opponent out, you're going to win. Well, they'll only blow my opponent out if I can actually have follow up to a card like Nibiru the Primal Being. Because, for example, if I Nibiru my opponent, right, I leave him with a, you know, 8k token, but I can't do anything on my turn, you know, I'm in really big danger of losing on, on the crackback on the next turn, right? And this happens a lot. I see this a lot, which is I opened a lot of defensive cards and I'm able to stop my opponent, but I mean, if I don't have any offense going for myself, I can't, these defensive cards are sort of meaningless. Uh, so, like, Ash Blossom is, is a different kind of defensive card. It's much more versatile, but it's a little bit softer. So some decks, if you're running, like, hand traps, maybe you want to open, you know, one or two hand traps. You're, you know, whereas if you're playing, like, Nibiru's and Winter Cherries and Dimensional Shifters and cards like those in your deck, you know, maybe you are really want to try to only open one. And opening two can sometimes lead to bad hands, right? And so this is the sort of the important thing to ask yourself is, you know, what kind of hand traps am I running? Remember, go back to what kind of your deck you're playing. And remember, you can, I, I made this bullet point here, you can test this yourself by taking out all the, the bad cards from your deck and shuffling, you know, and drawing cards and seeing like, okay, what if I had three card hands? Can I do well with three card hands? And, and sort of get a feel for yourself on how your deck operates when it only has three cards that actually, that it can actually do anything with. Whereas your defensive cards sort of are just there to stop your opponent. Remember, you want to have a, a good balance. A good balance is ideal. Okay, so now let's get into the data. Um, I've made this data public. I basically, I just wrote a, I wrote a, a program that spat out all this data and first i'll tell you how to read it and then we can get on to sort of interpreting it and what it means in the context for your decks okay so uh these bolded titles are the number of cards that defensive cards we're running in our deck you know remember don't forget like how many ashes we're running if we're running three ashes and that's our only hand trap we can take a look at this this section here. Okay, so the percent of opening at least one ash in this scenario is about 33% in a five card hand. Okay, the whole chance of opening exactly one ash is 30%. And the percent chance of exactly two ashes is 35%, 3.5%. And the chance of opening three or more ashes is, you know, one a tenth of a percent, right? Okay. So now that we've got sort of this, this how to read this data, let's also read this section. So a lot of these data, these, these sections, three and deck, four and deck, have this C section. And the C section, okay, that sounds a little weird, but this, uh, this C stands for change. So the change from the last, the last, uh, like the, the two. So the change from two to three. So the change from two to three of percent chance change that you get from getting at least one drawing at least one hand trap is 10%, which means I gained 10%. You can see that drawing exactly one hand trap, I have 22.44%. Drawing exactly one hand trap, when I have three cards in my deck, I have about 30.11%. So I've gained 7.68% uh, of, um, of extra percentage points uh, in a game. So that's sort of how to read this data. Okay, let's take a, let's take your, let's take a, a hypothetical deck. You know, Gren Maju, I think, falls into this category, but some decks also fall into this category, which is we run hand traps like, you know, Nibiru, Dimension Shifter, and we want to draw exactly one of them, right? Two is like, you know, it's acceptable. It's acceptable to draw two, but we really want to draw one hand trap. That's the ideal hand. We draw one hand trap, we use the rest of our cards to, to basically OT care opponent. Okay, let's take a look at a deck like that, right? And I want to show you something interesting. Okay, and this occurs at around when you add your ninth hand trap into your deck. Now look at this. The change in percentage points you get from adding a ninth hand trap from eight to nine, you actually lose percentage points of drawing exactly one hand trap. Now that, although it might be surprising to some people, you know, you are increasing your overall percentage of drawing a hand trap, but your chance of drawing two hand traps goes up by three and a half percent, and you actually lose percentage points because you have so many in your deck, you actually lose percentage points on drawing exactly one. So I would say that if you are planning on drawing exactly one hand trap in your deck, and you have a 40 card deck, you should not play more than eight because you actually hinder yourself if you want to draw exactly one hand trap. Now, that's not even to say that eight is correct, because look, uh, look at how much benefit we get from adding the eighth hand trap from seven to eight. We literally only get 
0.2% benefit for having that eighth you know, defensive card, right? Hand trap defensive card, whatever you want to call it. I'm sort of calling it the same thing in this video, right? Okay, so we're adding the eighth defensive card. We get only 0.2%. Now to put that in perspective, that's one in every 500 games. Whereas the chance that we get exactly two is about 3.69%. This is, you know, one every... Um, 30 games almost, right? One every 30 games. That's a, that's a, you know, between 30 and 500, you're really upping the chances you see two hand traps and not really upping the chances you see one hand trap by that much. So maybe eight is not even a good number. Now, this is, of course, something for you to evaluate. Okay. So, you know, we can take a look at seven and seven is at least a little more reasonable. By adding the seventh hand trap, we get an extra percentage point. But remember, percentage points, again, like I say, this is one every, maybe one every 80 games right? If you think of your average big tournament, even your long YCSs, you know, even if you somehow make it all the way to the finals, you play 10 rounds, 11 rounds in Swiss, you play another five rounds in Taka, you're playing 16 games, right? Even if every, 16 matches, even if you play three games a match, that's what, 30, 48 games, you still might not you might not even get this extra 1.24%. You might have been fine playing six hand traps in your deck instead of seven, even if you've played that many, which is kind of crazy to think about. So for somewhere for me in Grand Maju, at least, is, you know, somewhere like somewhere in the sweet spot, six, five, something like this. You're not running too many defensive cards um, because... Look, I'm getting at least some benefit off our run six, right? 2.5 is maybe... 2.5% is maybe one every, you know... 40 or so games and and I'm actually not too too disappointed if I draw more right and by the way when I say 2.5 I mean the difference the difference between running six and five the actual percentages are right here okay the chance of I open exactly one is 42.29 percent the chance I open exactly two is 13.64 okay I, I like to talk about change because it sort of shows you where you're you're skirting the border and that's why I sort of included these change statistics but anyway okay so I'm getting at least some value here right if if my goal is to draw one hand trap Okay, so maybe six, five, somewhere around this range is, is what I think is like the ideal range. But okay, you know, that's sort of like if I want to draw exactly one hand trap because my hand traps are sort of like big bomb cards that sort of just totally skip your opponent's turn. But what if you're a deck that, you know, I, all of my friends, they like to run Ash Blossoms, Ghost Ogres. You're like a Salaman great deck. You can draw maybe more than, than one hand trap, right? Uh, you're, you're okay with that. Okay, so what, what can we look at here? Well... Maybe you say, I'm okay with one or two, you know, maybe I prefer one, but I'm, I'm okay with drawing two hand traps, but drawing three is really, really risky. I don't want to draw three hand traps. Well, okay, let's take a look at something here. Let's go all the way down to 15. Okay, um, so we, you know, you can see the, the craziness here. If you have 15 hand traps, from 14 to 15, you your chances of drawing three or more went up 8%. It is a huge percentage. Oh my God, look at that. The chances of drawing three or more hand traps when you have uh, 14 and 15 is just absolutely massive. I mean, that's a crazy change. So, you, you know, probably if you're playing a Salam Ranger deck, you're like, uh, I really don't want to draw three hand traps. I'm definitely not going to put 15 hand traps in my deck, okay? Now, 14. Let's take a look at 14. Again, 14 is not the greatest. You're not getting the greatest bang for your buck here. You're all losing out chances on drawing exactly one from, from 13. Again, remember, uh, you know, it's you, you only have a tiny extra chance of drawing two, and you're still increasing your chances of drawing three or more by quite a bit. So maybe 14 is not even optimal if you want to draw one or two hand traps. Okay. So, you know, this is sort of interesting. All right. So now a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh players get confused. They say, they say, oh, I put 14 hand traps in my deck. I've got 90% chance to draw a hand trap. And that is true. However, you are not realizing that sometimes you might just totally break because you've just drawn three hand traps. I mean, this happens 22% of the time. That's pretty crazy. You know, if you're breaking 22% of the time, you're not going to be doing very well at a tournament. Now, of course, this depends. Okay, well, let's go. Let's, let's take a look at 13 hand traps, 13 in your deck, right? Okay, again, we're still losing exactly one. We, we get some benefit here, but again, we're, we're still, I'm not seeing the benefit here. We're getting some percentage points in exactly two. We're losing some in exactly one, and we still have a ton in three or more. Okay, so still not the greatest. All right, all right, so let's keep going. Let's, let's skip a few. Let's go to 10. Let's check out how 10 is doing. Okay, 10 again is, 
you're actually getting some percentage points here for ex exactly two. And, you know, you're, you're still, you know, if you do this minus this, you're still, you're, you're less than a chance of drawing exactly three. So maybe 10 is not the most ideal number. Now, nine is where it starts to kick in. Look at nine hand traps. I'm drawing two hand traps 3.5 more percent of the time. I'm drawing one, you know, 70.7% less, but I'm at least gaining if you, you know, if I add these two numbers up, I'm getting around two point, you know, two points like eight or something total. And that's more than this risk that I'm taking for drawing three hand traps. So, I mean, nine is a pretty common number in decks, and maybe this is sort of the mathematical reason for why. But as you can see that if I want to draw one or two hand traps, maybe something like nine will work out pretty well for me because I'm at least it's doing better than eight because I, I'm at least increasing my chances of drawing two or one more than I'm increasing my chances of drawing three or more. Okay, and so this is the basic idea. Now, I could go look at this data for hours and hours and hours and, and theorize, but I want to summarize this by saying, okay, let's remember, you want to consider how your deck works. Okay, that's important, right? Because if your deck doesn't, you know, it depends on your deck. Uh, if you have Zodiacs, you know, you just jam every Zodiac card in your deck. Now, of course, this is back in the day. You just jam every Zodiac card in your deck and play the rest of the hand traps, right? That doesn't matter. Okay, but you know, if you're playing a deck like Salaman, Grey, Grand Mage, you sub terror, you know, you want to be careful. You want to be careful. And so I think you should, you know, go ahead. This, this, Data will be in the description. It's going to be, there is a link. I'm going to share this with you. You can take a look at it, make your own judgments, make your own judgment calls. But I wanted to at least give you sort of the mathematical reasoning behind why I run, you know, but behind what mathematical reasoning that you can use to sort of make your own decisions. Um, okay, so that's going to be it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Again, these videos do take a lot of work to make. If you enjoy them, please, 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 please subscribe. Thank you for staying all the way to the end. Um, I appreciate it. Okay, next time, I think next Math and Yu-Gi-Oh! video I'm going to do is, is it okay to run more than 40 cards sometimes? That's a very de contentious, debated issue. If you want, you know, so please subscribe and turn on your notifications so you can see that video when it comes out. Um, also, thanks to uh, one of my viewers who suggested this question. He actually asked me this question. Uh, very cool question. I, honestly, I'll be honest with you, I don't get many comments. <laughs> I only have like 200-something subscribers. So if you have a suggestion, I will probably read it. I'll probably respond to it. And if it's a good one, I'll probably make a video on it. So suggest a way, comment a way, like, please subscribe, help me get to 300. I will see you guys next time. You guys have a good day.